Hello YouTube, I'm Annie Johnson. The world is horrible, everything is wrong, and this is The Secret Garden, Chapter 5. Hi there YouTube, I'm Annie Johnson. The world is terrible, everything is wrong in it, and this is The Secret Garden, Chapter 5. Hi there YouTube, I'm Annie Johnson. Everything is wrong in the world today, and this is The Secret Garden, Chapter 5. The Cry in the Corridor at first, each day which passed by for Mary Lennox was exactly like the others. Every morning, she awoke in her tapestried room and found Martha kneeling upon the hearth building her fire. Every morning, she ate her breakfast in the nursery, which had nothing amusing in it. And after each breakfast, she gazed out of the window across the huge moor, which seemed to spread out on all sides and climb up to the sky. And after she had stared for a while, she realized that if she did not go out, she would have to stay in and do nothing, and so she went out. She did not know that this was the best thing she could have done, and she did not know that. When she began to walk quickly or even run along the paths and down the avenue, she was stirring her slow blood and making herself strong by fighting with the wind which swept down from the moor. She ran only to make herself warm, and she hated the wind which rushed at her face and roared and held her back as if it were some giant she could not see. But the big breaths of rough, fresh air blown over the hearth filled her lungs with something which was good for her whole thin body and whipped some red color into her cheeks and brightened her dull eyes when she did not know anything about it. But after a few days spent almost entirely out of doors, she wakened one morning knowing what it was to be hungry, and when she sat down to her breakfast she did not glance disdainfully at her porridge and push it away but took up her spoon and began to eat it and went on eating until her bowl was empty. Are they saying she just didn't eat for a few days? Like, personal experience with starvation tells me it y you reach that point sooner than a few days. Right, moving on. They got on well enough, but with that this morning, didn't the? said Martha. It tastes nice today, said Mary, feeling a little surprised herself. It's the air of the moor that's given the stomach for the victuals, answered Martha. It's lucky for thee that they got victuals as well as appetite. There's been twelve in our college that's had the stomach and nothing to put in it. You go on playing you out of doors every day and they'll get some flesh on your bones and it won't be so yeller. Alright, I want to Again, apologize to the people of Yorkshire. I'm terrible at accents, but in my defense, I am reading it the way it is spelled on the page. And if that does not come out like a Yorkshire accent, at least half of the fault is the pages. Because looking at the way that, that the words are spelled on here does not in any way relate to what I found of Yorkshire accents by looking up the Yorkshire accent on YouTube. I don't know if I am t bad at reading as I am at saying accents, or if the Yorkshire accent has changed in the century since the book was written, or if this is some sub-dialect of Yorkshire or something. I don't know what's going on, but I'm reading it a as it appears on the page, which kind of is coming off as American South or Appalachian. Uh, and it's just, it's, that's what we're doing. Moving on. on. Is the air the more that's given the stomach for the victuals, answered Martha. It's lucky for thee that that's got victuals as well as appetite. There's been twelve in our college that's had the stomach and nothing to put in it. You go on playing you out of doors every day and you'll get some flesh on your bones and you won't be so yeller. I don't play, said Mary. I have nothing to play with. Nothing to play with, exclaimed Martha. Our children plays with sticks and stones. They just runs around shouting and looks at things. Mary did not shout, but she looked at things. There was nothing else to do. She walked around and round the gardens and wandered about the paths in the park. Sometimes she looked for Ben Weatherstaff, but though the several times she saw him at work, he was too busy to look at her or was too surly. Once, when she was walking towards him, he picked up his spade and turned away as if he did, did it on purpose. One place she went to oftener than any other it was the long walk outside the garden with the walls around them. 
There were bare flower beds on either side of it, and against the walls ivy grew thickly. There was one part of the wall where the creeping dark green leaves were more bushy than elsewhere. It seemed as if for a long time the part had been neglected. The rest of it had been clipped and made to look neat, but at this lower end of the walk it had not been trimmed at all. A few days after she had talked to Ben Weatherstaff, Mary stopped to notice this and wondered why it was so. She had just paused and was looking up at a long spray of ivy swinging in the wind and when she saw a gleam of scarlet and heard a brilliant chirp. And there on the top of the wall perched Ben Weatherstaff's robin redbreast, tilted forward to look at her with a small head on one side. Oh, she cried out, is it you, is it you? And it did not seem at all queer to her that she spoke to him as if he were sure that he would understand and answer her. He did answer. He twittered and chirped and hopped along the wall as if he were telling her all sorts of things. It seemed to Mistress Mary as if she understood him, too, though he was not speaking in words. It was as if he said, Good morning. Isn't the wind nice? Isn't the sun nice? Isn't everything nice? Let us both chirp and hop and twitter. Come on, come on. Mary began to laugh, and as he hopped and took little f flights along the wall, she ran after him. Poor little thin, sallow, ugly Mary. She actually looked almost pretty for a moment. I like you, I like you, she cried out, pattering down the walk as she chirped and tried to whistle, which last she did not know how to do in the least. But the robin seemed to be quite satisfied and chirped and whistled back at her. At last he spread his wings and made a darting flight to the top of a tree where he perched and sang loudly. That reminded Mary of the first time she had seen him. He had been swinging on a treetop then, and she had been standing in the orchard. Now she was on the other side of the orchard, standing in the path outside a wall much lower down, and there was the same tree inside. It's in the garden no one can go into, she said to herself. It's the garden without a door. He lives in there. How I wish I could go see what it was like. She ran up the walk to the green door she had entered the first morning. Then she ran down the path through the door, through the other door, and then into the orchard. And when she stood and looked up, there was the tree on the other side of the wall, and there was the robin just finishing his song and beginning to preen his feathers with his beak. It is the garden, she said. I'm sure of it. She walked around and looked closely at that side of the orchard wall, but she only found what she had found before, that there was no door in. Then she ran through the kitchen gardens again and out into the walk outside the long ivy-covered wall, and then she walked to the end of it and looked at it. But there was no door. And then she walked to the other end, looking again, but there was no door. It's very queer, she said. Ben Weatherstaff said there was no door and there is no door. But there must have been one ten years ago, because Mr. Craven buried the key. This gave her so much to think of that she began to be quite interested and feel that she was not sorry that she had come to Misselthwaite Manor. In India, she had always felt hot and too languid to care much about anything. The fact was that the fresh wind from the moor had begun to blow the cobwebs out of her young brain and to awaken her up a little. She stayed out of doors nearly all day, and when she sat down to her supper at night, she felt hungry and drowsy and comfortable. She did not feel cross when Martha chattered away. She felt as if she rather liked to hear her, and at last she thought she would ask her a question. She asked it after she had finished her supper, and had sat down on the hearth rug before the fire. Why did Mr. Craven hate the garden, she said. She had made Martha stay with her, and Martha had not objected at all. She was very young and used to be used to a crowded college full of brothers and sisters, and she found it dull in the great servants' hall downstairs, where the footmen and upper housemaids made fun of her Yorkshire speech and looked upon her as a common little thing, and sat and whispered among themselves. Martha liked to talk, and the strange child who had lived in India and been waited upon by blacks was novelty enough to attract her. She sat down on the hearth herself without waiting to be asked. Aren't the thinking about the garden yet? she said. I knew the wood. That was just the way with me when I first heard about it. Why did he hate it? Mary persisted. Martha tucked her feet under her and made herself quite comfortable. Listen to the wind wuthering round the house, she said. You could bear stand up in the moor if you was out on it tonight. Mary did not know what wuthering meant until she listened, and then she understood. 
It must mean that hollow, shuddering sort of roar which rushed around and around the house as if the giant no one could see were buffeting it and beating at the walls and windows to try and break in. But one knew he could not get in, and somehow it made one feel very safe and warm inside a room with a red coal fire. But why did he hate it so, she asked after she had listened. She intended to know if Martha did. Then Martha gave up her store of knowledge. Mine, she said. Mrs. Medlock said it's not to be talked about. There's a lot of things in this place it's not to be talked over. That's Mr. Craven's orders. His troubles are none servant's business, he says. But for the garden, he wouldn't be like he is. It was Mrs. Craven's garden that she had made when first they were married, and she just loved it. And they used to tend the flowers themselves. None of the gardeners was ever let to go in. Him and her used to go in and shut the door and stay there hours and hours reading and talking. And she was just a bit of a girl, and there was an old tree with a branch bent like a seat on it. She made roses grow over it, and she used to sit there. But one day when she was sitting there, the branches broke, and she fell on the ground and was hurt so bad, the next day she died. The, the garden just, like, straight up murdered this woman? This is... This is kind of, the secret garden's getting dark. I mean... They keep anthropomorphizing the garden like it's alive, and now we find out it's a murderer? That's... it's kind of... Eh. I don't know if I'd want to... Yeah, I'd still want to break into the garden. Yeah, I would. Okay. The next day she died. The doctors thought he'd go out of his mind and die too. That's why he hates it. No one's never gone in since, and he won't let anyone talk about it. Mary did not ask any more questions. She looked at the red fire and listened to the wind wuthering. It seemed to be wuthering louder than ever. At that moment, a very good thing was happening to her. Four good things had happened to her, in fact, since she came to Misslethwaite Manor. She had felt as if she had understood a robin and that he had understood her. She had run in the wind until her blood had grown warm, and she had been healthily hungry for the first time in her life, and she had found out what it was to be sorry for someone. But as she was listening to the wind, she began to listen to something else. She did not know what it was, because at first she could not scarcely dis distinguish it from the wind itself. It was a curious sound. It seemed almost as if a child were crying somewhere. Sometimes the wind sounded rather like a child crying, but presently Mistress Mary felt quite sure this sound was inside the house, not outside it. It was far away, but it was inside. She turned around and looked at Martha. Do you hear anyone crying? she said. Martha suddenly looked confused. No, she answered. It's the wind. Sometimes it sounds like it, like as if someone was lost in the moor in Waylon. It's got all sorts of sounds. But listen, said Mary. It's in the house, down one of those long corridors. At that very moment, a door must have been opened somewhere downstairs, for a great rushing draft blew along the passage and the door of the room they sat in was blown open with a crash, and they both jumped to their feet. The light was blown out, and crying sound was swept down a far corridor, so that it was to be heard more plainly than ever. There, said Mary, I told you so. It is someone crying, and it isn't a grown-up person. Martha ran and shut the door and turned the key. Before she did it, they both heard the sound of a door in some far passageway, shutting with a bang, and then everything was quiet. For even the wind ceased withering for a few moments. It was the wind, said Martha stubbornly, and if it wasn't, it was little Betty Butterworth. That's really it. That doesn't sound like a real name. It was little Betty Butterworth, the scullery maid, and she's had the toothache all day. But something troubled and awkward in her manner made Mistress Mary stare very hard at her. She did not believe she was speaking the truth. Let's look at my scene checklist. The cry in the corridor. All right, I'm I'm gonna skip setting and point of view. They're they, they're almost pointless to these analyses. All right, this in theory doesn't really fit well the set sequel format that I'm I'm trying to use to understand scenes. But um, actually, now that I think about it, yeah, this this book doesn't well fit the set sequel, which is a 
a way of setting scenes so that they're to, to build a, a pacing, right? So the person has a goal, does things, usually goes wrong, um, and then they react to the, the change of circumstances. Um, kind of a way to set a fast pacing, but this book doesn't do that. It's actually more of a slow, uh, enjoy the scenery kind of, kind of book, which I guess is valid. Yeah, it's kind of uh, more of what we had last chapter. She's exploring the house, getting her bearings. Beginning of the second act, she's starting slowly reacting and figuring out her new situation. Um, and maybe this cry, cry in the corridor that is coming up in the next chapter will be the actual pinch point. Or maybe, maybe it was last, I don't know. We get the whole nature and being back in England makes her healthy for for reasons. Let's just not unpack that again. Copy basically what I wrote from the last one and put it in. Actually, I kind of wonder if each scene is actually seems to spread across two or three chapters. It's, yeah, maybe. Scenes and chapters don't have to line up. I mean, technically this should have had two scenes because it's a her exploring scene and then her talking to, to Martha scene, but I don't know. I don't know. Oh, lockdown hair is so... Uh, on the edge of greatness Turning darkness to light mm -hmm, mm -hmm, We're gonna fight We're gonna win in the end Fun fact, however, when you try to spell out an accent for the page, it's called an eye dialect because it's a dialect for the eyes. 